Hello everyone, it's Dr. Trussell here. We're going to be talking today about professional ethics and accounting. One of the cases that you're going to be completing for the course is related to ethics. So consider this an introduction to ethics, but more related to ethics in accounting. That is, how is a professional accountant deal with ethical situations and ethical dilemma? More broadly, what are ethics? We think of ethics as a set of moral principles or values. We all have a set of values. We may not consider them explicitly, but we all have them. What is important to you? What do you value? What, what is your moral compass? In the accounting profession, society has a very high expectations for accountants for accountants regarding ethical behavior, much more than many other professions. So we think of your personal moral principles, but then the accounting profession has additional expectations. That's because accountants are the gatekeepers for financial information. In other words, external parties, parties external to a company, are only going to receive information once it comes to the accountants. So we have a very high level of duty regarding the integrity of financial data. So accounting professionals are expected to conduct themselves at a higher level than most other members of society based on the expectations that society has. Think about what an auditor does, for example. They who more broadly, what are ethical principles? You have to really define your own ethical principles broadly. We have some that are designated for the profession, but when it comes right down to it, you have to have your own set of moral values. The Josephson Institute, for example, has a set of ethical principles. Now, these are not for business or anything. They're just generally speaking. I just wanted to give you an example. And they have this trustworthiness, responsibility, caring, respect, fairness, and citizenship. Again, not related to business, but just to give you uh, an example of a set of ethical principles that exist. You can do go into various um, organizations and disciplines, and they'll have their own set. The, when it comes to the profession, the accounting profession, when you look at a certified public accountant, there's a definite set of ethical standards that are at the minimum level that you're supposed to follow. So how do you conduct yourself as a CPA? Several things help to drive that. For example, you um, uh, take have to pass a CPA exam, and the CPA exam has questions related to ethics. If you're an auditor, then you have to follow generally accepted auditing standards, which tells you how you're supposed to conduct an audit. When you become a CPA, you'll have to continue to uh, gain education through what they call continuing professional education. After you graduate, after you get your CPA, you still have to take classes very important there is a legal liability if you don't conduct yourself um, according to way you're supposed to as a professional in accounting you might face legal liability for example conducting an audit in a fraudulent manner you might end up in jail or at least uh, have some kind of penalties you have to pay the AICPA the American Institute of Public Accountants has um, practice and quality centers that help you to know how you're supposed to conduct yourself. And the AICPA also has this thing called the Code of Professional Conduct. We're going to talk about in a second, but it's basically a minimum level of behavior. The PCAOB, which is the Public Company Public Companies Accounting Oversight Board, is for publicly traded companies it oversees the accounting and auditing of those companies. And the SEC is the watchdog for the Securities and Exchange Commission, a watchdog for the, um, for the um, stock market. Peer review means that you have one CPA firm auditing uh, another CPA firm to make sure that they have good quality control 
which are the procedures that you have in place that you're conducting a good audit, that you're, you have um, you're making good tax returns, et cetera, that your conduct is according to a professional. The code of professional conduct is something that is put together by the AICPA, the American Institute of CPAs, but also most states uh, adhere to a similar code. They consist of principles, which are broad, um, very broad, ideal standards of ethical conduct, very philosophical, very conceptual. They're not enforceable because of the way they're the way they're so broad but what are enforceable are the rules of conduct very important means you have to follow these rules as a CPA if you don't there can be consequences such as losing your right to practice in front of the IRS for example interpretations of the rules they are not enforceable but if you don't follow them you have to justify a departure those are just interpreting those rules final part of the code of professional conduct is ethical rulings those are public published explanations and answers to questions about the rules of conduct submitted to the AICPA by practitioners and others interested in ethical requirements they're not reforceable enforceable but if you depart from them you have to justify it why would you depart for it? so in other words they're not directly enforceable but sort of they are because if you don't do it you could get in trouble Well, I mentioned earlier the ethical principles, these broad kind of conceptual or philosophical uh, principles that the AICPA has, but it gives you an idea of what's expected ethically, what's expected, or how should you conduct yourself as a professional accountant. First of all, professionals should exercise sensitive and moral judgments in all of their activities. And you have a public interest in mind. You should accept the obligation to act in a way to serve and honor the public. You always have to think about those that are using the financial statements. Number three is the integrity. Very important. Members should perform all responsibilities with integrity to maintain the public confidence. You have to keep the confidence of the public. If you don't, um, you, you, the, the whole profession falls apart. You have to be objective and independence, should be objective, independence, and free from conflicts of interest. For example, you if you're an auditor, you can't audit the company and own stock in that company. That would be a conflict of interest. You would have to sell your stock or not be on that engagement. Do professional care is number five. Members should observe the profession standards and strive to improve competence. In other words, you're going to be looked at how other professional accounts would have acted in your in your situation so that's going to be what we call due professional care and then number six the scope and nature of services a member in public practice should observe the code of professional conduct in other words if you're in public accounting you have to do that however even if you're in private accounting and you're a cpa you do have to follow these rules Well, the cases that we're going to be covering in this class deal with ethical dilemmas. An ethical dilemma is a situation a person faces in which a decision must be made about appropriate behavior. So you're, you're, you're at work and maybe that your boss tells you to do something and you think it might not be the best thing to do, morally speaking. So you have this dilemma. Should you do it or should you not do it? Some people will go ahead and act unethically, and then they'll try to rationalize it. Well, everybody does it, so why shouldn't I? Oh, well, it's legal, so it must be ethical. Or what's the likelihood that someone's going to find it, and what would be the consequences? Well, that's rationalization. You should always do what's right, regardless if other people are doing it or not. Or again, just because someone says, well, that's, that's legal, so I can do it. No, that might not be the best thing for your company. It might be legal, but it's not the best thing to do. 
So in the case, we're going to have a six step approach to resolve this ethical dilemma. So this is what you follow when you see the case that you're assigned. First, you obtain all the relevant facts. That is, whatever the situation is, list all the facts relevant to the dilemma. So in other words, to, to decide whether it's ethical or not, you have to know all of the facts. And then identify the ethical dilemma. The dilemma should be considered from the perspective of a specific employee in, in the company of the company in question, not necessarily just the company as a whole, but what this because when you face a dilemma, it's you as a, as an individual. Should you do it or should you should you not? Number three, who identify who is affected by the outcome and how each group is affected. No, notice that there are two parts: who is affected and how is each person affected. Think carefully about who might be effect, impacted because many students tend to omit people or groups in the step because they don't think of the big picture. There are typically several people that are impacted by a dilemma. Step four, identify the alternatives available to resolve the dilemma. There are almost always more than two alternatives. Many students think that the alternatives are to do the item in question or to not do it. Should I do what the boss tells me or should I not? There are other possible alternatives available, like maybe go above his head, uh, quit the firm, you know, various things like that. Number five, identify the likely consequences of each alternative. So go back to number four, and for each of those, each of those alternatives, list the consequences. So there'll be at least at least one consequence for each of the alternatives you came up with in number four. And then finally, decide upon the appropriate action. Here's where you have to make a decision. What would you do in those circumstances? If you were faced with that, what would you do? Take all the things that you learn in the first five steps and then make a decision. Okay, here's an example. Brian Longwood has been working six months as a staff assistant for Barton and Barton CPAs. So he's an auditor working for this CPA firm. Currently, he's assigned to the audit of Rayon Manufacturing Company under the supervision of Charles Dickerson, an experienced audit senior. There are three auditors assigned to the audit, including Brian, Charles, and a more experienced assistant, Martha Mills. During lunch on the first day, Charles says, it will be necessary for us to work a few extra hours on our own time to make sure we come in on budget. This audit isn't very profitable anyway, and we don't want to hurt our firm by going over budget. We can accomplish this easily by coming in a half an hour early, taking a short lunch break, and working an hour or so after normal quitting time. We just won't enter that time on our budget. Brian recalls reading the firm's policy that working hours that working hours and not charging for them on the time report is a violation of Barton Barton's employment policy. He also knows that seniors are paid bonuses instead of overtime, whereas staff are paid for overtime but get no bonuses. Later, when discussing this issue with Martha, she says, Charles does this on all of jobs. He's likely to be our firm's ne next audit manager. The partners think he's great because his jobs always come in under budget. I wonder why, right? He rewards us by giving us good engagement evaluations, especially under the cooperative attitude category. Several of the other audit seniors follow the same practice. So that's the case. Let's apply the six steps to that case. Number one, obtain the relevant facts. Well, we know a staff person, that is Brian. We have to look at Brian Longview. Second step, identify the ethical dilemma. Is it ethical for Brian Longwood to work hours and not record them as hours worked in this situation? It's normally just kind of a brief one sentence. Is it ethical to do this or not? And notice the perspective is from Brian. So you're gonna put yourself in his shoes. Who is affected by the outcome of the dilemma and how? Who and how? Well, Brian, he's being asked to violate firm policy. Hours of work, how much hours he has to work is affected. His pay will be affected because he's not gonna get paid for working overtime when he should. His performance evaluations may be affected. If he doesn't do it, he's gonna get a bad evaluation. 
and his attitude may, about the firm may be affected. He's just, uh, he's brand new and they're asking him to do this kind of stuff right at the beginning. Martha is going to have the same uh, effect, effect on her as it did on Brian. Charles, who is the senior asking him to do this, his success on the engagement and in the firm may be affected because he may be coming over budget and may not become the next audit manager. And of course, he'll have to work more. The CPA firm itself, the stated firm policies being violated, may result in underbilling clients in the current and future engagements. That is, you're not uh, billing them. You're not sending a bill of the proper, appropriate number because they're not charging the right number of hours which may affect the firm's ability to budget engagements, future engagements. You're under reporting time, you're not gonna get a good budget, you're not gonna bill the clients appropriately. And it may be difficult to motivate and retain employees if you're asking to do some things that are unethical. Continuing on with step three, the staff assigned to Rayon in the future may also be infected because they'll have unrealistic time budgets. They'll never be able to meet those budgets. They may have, which would lead to unfavorable perform performance evaluations and continue the pressure, the pressure to continue not charging for hours worked. And then other staff in the firm, if they follow this practice, it may motivate others to follow the same practice on other engagements. Step four is identify the alternatives to resolve the dilemma. What could you possibly do? You could refuse. Now, normally you think of this as do it or not do it, right? Don't do it, refuse it, or go ahead and do it. But there are other alternatives. You could have formed Charles that you're not going to do it. Or he'll charge, if he does do it, he's going to charge the hours. Just tell him. You could go over his head and ask a partner or a manager. You could refuse to work on that particular engagement with that company. Or you can quit working for the firm altogether. Step five is identify the likely consequences of each alternative. So for this step, you're going to take all those alternatives in step four and consider what might happen if that choice was selected. And what you want to do is consider both short-term and long-term consequences. For example, if they choose not to work the additional hours, if he chooses, then he will likely receive a poor evaluation from Charles. But if he works the additional hours without charging them, he'll probably get a good evaluation in the short term, but in the long run, he will likely be asked to do other things that are unethical, like signing off on procedures that he did not actually perform. In other words, saying that he did it and not, and not do it. Finally, step six, decide on the appropriate action. What would you do in these circumstances? Take all those five steps, take them all together, and decide how should you perceive. Here you have to make a decision. You have to say you would do one of these steps. You would, sorry, you would do one of the, take one of these actions. So you would have to say, I would do this, I would do X because. Okay, so that is the six step process that you're gonna to use to solve the cases that you're gonna have assigned. And there is a template on UTC Learn under the case folder and in the course materials and you can use that to complete the uh, complete your analysis of the case.